Hi, I'm Mac Monroe, and I'm the founder and CEO of Boss Builders. The presentation I'm going to show you now is the one that we do at all the HR conferences, but since many of you probably don't get the chance to get away and go to those conferences, I thought we'd bring the presentation to you. And so over the next 50 minutes or so, I want to share some strategies to help you build a better boss. If you're watching this video now, there's a very good chance that you are an overworked, overstressed, overwhelmed, and underappreciated HR professional. And probably one of the reasons why you are stressed is the quality of the managers and supervisors at the organization in which you work. Now, I know this because when I present at these different conferences, often I'll stay around a night before or maybe a night after, and I watch what happens when the sessions are over. And HR professionals being overstressed and finally with a chance to get away often let me know just how tough the job is. What I'm going to share with you, though, are things that you can take back immediately and put to use in your organizations that will help your managers improve their skills. And if you follow the formula I'm going to share with you, there's a very good chance you could do this inexpensively and very efficiently. So go ahead, sit back, take the notes. You have a handout in front of you. You'll notice when we get to the slides that there's a corresponding page number in your notes. So just pay attention to that. And let's go ahead and talk about how to build better bosses. On the morning of October the 11th, 1996, I woke up not knowing what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But by noon that day, I had absolute perfect clarity. At the time, I was in my first role as a supervisor, stationed at the Naval Dental Center over in Silverdale, Washington. I had 22 direct reports in this dental clinic, and my boss was the clinic director. Now, <clears throat> he probably goes down in history as the worst boss that I ever had. He looked a little bit like the Burger King King from the commercials that we used to watch, and uh, his name was Captain Davies. Captain Davies wasn't a screamer. He just talked to you like you were stupid, like you were a child. And so every day, I saw my role as one of protecting my technicians from this animal, and secondly, being his liaison. And so that meant what I had to do is have a morning meeting with him every day to get his to-do list of things that needed to get done. And some of these things were pretty mundane, like replace the pens on the clipboards at the front desk. Stuff that definitely was not that important, but in his mind it was absolutely of utmost importance. Now what made this even more difficult is that I really, again, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I sort of stumbled my way into the Navy. I wanted to be a dental lab technician. I was not able to do that, so I was stuck as a dental chairside assistant. When I got married, my wife was very motivated and driven. She was also active duty, and so she said that our goal should be becoming naval officers. And there was a program through the Medical Service Corps where if you have a college degree, you can apply. If you get selected, you become an ensign, which is neat because, of course, the pay goes up, but also it's a better career path. And so we began by working on a Bachelor of Science degree in healthcare management from Southern Illinois University. Now, we applied for the program the first year and were rejected. And when we did some digging, we found out that everybody that got selected had a master's degree. And so that meant we had to figure out how to get a master's degree. And so for me, it was particularly challenging because I'm a pretty lazy student. I graduated with a 2.4 GPA. And my criteria for a master's was pretty simple. It just didn't need to have math in it because I'm terrible at math. And so after doing some searching, I found the only program that I could get in that didn't have math was a master's in organizational leadership from Chapman University. And so with that very low standard for myself, I began the program and absolutely had no interest in it. Now, this sort of coincided with my misery at work. And not only did I just finally not want to do anything with that officer program, I just didn't know what I would do if I walked out of the Navy. But I do know that I was miserable. But the beauty of that morning, October the 11th, 1996, I had absolute clarity. Captain Davies was going through his long to-do list, and then he asked me why the uh, plan of the week had not been updated in the officer's lounge. Now, the plan of the week was a document the command would send out, and in the document it gave you a list of coming events. So I said, of course, I don't know, sir. So he made me walk back with him to the officer's lounge, and he's going through his uh, there's a big clipboard with the plans of the week on there. And so he's flipping through and he's saying, you know, look at this. This is outdated. It's two weeks old. Don't they teach you how to read a calendar in that master's program? And I think that's when I snapped. Now, his back was to me, so he didn't see this. But I actually brought up my fist, ready to bring it down to the back of his head. 
And the only reason I didn't kill my boss that morning was that my son, Dustin, was only about three months old. And I thought, you know, if I kill my boss, I'll end up going to the brig and, you know, Leavenworth and I'll never see my kid and he'll wind up in the system or whatever. But, but I had clarity and I knew at that moment that my goal in life was to create the next great generation of great bosses. And so the reason I always start all of my talks with that story is that for most people, they can relate to the story of a bad boss. And right now, if you're an HR professional, you have to deal with that kind of nonsense. Bad bosses who are bad either because they are just bad hearted or because they don't have the skills or knowledge or focus to do the job correctly. Now, because that probably falls into your lap, I'm gonna share a strategy that we share with organizations to help them get around that. And even in doing that, I'm going to tell you some of the biggest mistakes that you can make when you're trying to implement a program to develop better bosses. And so keep that in mind. You probably have a bad boss story as well. And what I've always found, too, is that a person always remembers the best boss they ever had and the worst boss they ever had. Everybody else is just a blur in between. Our goal is to build better bosses. So let's begin at the beginning. I'm certain that if you ever get onto LinkedIn, you probably have seen these infographics floating around. And they all kind of say the same thing. What they're trying to summarize here is that bosses or managers are bad and leaders are good. And so with that in mind, what I'd like to do is see if we can kind of flip that around a little bit. And so that leads us to a quiz. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a quiz up here and I want you to see if you can figure out the right answer. How do we best summarize these diagrams? Is the uh, A, leadership is necessary and needed at all levels of the organization, is that the correct answer? Or is it B, having bosses leads to significant liability from an HR perspective? Is it C, having leaders will increase retention while bosses will lead to turnover? D, all of the above, E, none of the above. Now, when I do this talk at SHRM conferences, I always offer one of my books as a prize. And so I don't know if you know the right answer. I'm sure that you have an idea, but to be honest, the right answer is E. It's none of the above. So your question is, well, what is the right answer? Well, we're going to get to that because we're going to revisit one of those infographics. But what I don't want you to do is get stuck in the mindset that bosses are bad and leaders are good. Now, to develop better bosses, because that's the goal, first of all, I got to tell you how to do it wrong. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the top five biggest mistakes that people make when they do management development. Now, this is important to realize that you may have done some of these and I don't want you to feel bad or hate me. I'm just going to tell you the reasons why these are not good ideas. And so if you've done them before and they're working good, I'm glad, then continue. It may work with your culture and your company, but it's a cautionary tale for those of you who have not done, not done anything. Pay attention to these because these can get you in real trouble. So we're going to do them with number five being the least big one all the way to number one, which is the largest one. So let's begin at the beginning. Number five, the number five biggest mistake people make when they do management development is failing to understand the difference between management training and management development. Now we'll look at this in more depth in a little bit, but just keep in mind that training is designed to improve skills. Development then is helping a person who has learned those skills actually do those skills better. The way that we fix training is very different from the way that we fix development. And the reason we want to be careful is that if you mix and match any of these options, you're going to get in real trouble. Now I'm going to tell you the difference as we get into our presentation, but just know that this is a big mistake. Don't confuse the two. They're very different and they serve very different purposes. That's number five. Here's number four, using a piecemeal approach to management development. Now, I read on LinkedIn, because they always have ads on LinkedIn, that there is this program now that it, it's Book Digest. And so their hook line says, did you know that the average CEO reads 60 books a year? Well, I think that's baloney, because in my experience, the average CEO doesn't read any books per year. What they do is they read LinkedIn articles and articles from the Harvard Business Review. And because they do that, and because they're not getting context, they will come to you, the HR professional, and they'll say things like this. Hey, I was just reading this really, really interesting article, and it says that we gotta get our arms wrapped around this new Generation Z. 
this iGen, because boy, they're gonna come to the workforce and they're gonna trash everything and it's gonna be a big mess. So you need to get some training out there on dealing with the Generation Z. Or you'll hear this one, hey, I was reading a great article and it's on mindfulness and, and we need to do more mindfulness around here. So you need to go find a trainer that can do mindfulness training. Or here's the classic, right? You know, we did these corporate changes and nobody wants to do it. Everybody's bitching and complaining. So I need you to go find a trainer to come in here and do training on change management. All of those are epic fails because right, right then what you're doing is you're trying to solve one problem without the context of many. And that's why piecemeal is always such a bad idea. If you're going to do training, do whatever it is, but make sure it fits in a sequence. What happens with piecemeal is that your audience, which are typically overworked and frustrated managers, they're going to start getting upset. Like, oh, what is it this month? Now every month is something different. And I got all these different books and we do Myers-Briggs, then we do DISC, and then we do all these other things. It leads to apathy, which means your managers don't care anymore, which means when you want to put on training, they think of every reason not to go to training. You're spending money. They're not showing up. Results don't get better and the blame goes right back to you. So don't use a piecemeal approach, have a plan. And as we go through this presentation, I'm gonna give you what a good plan would look like. That's number four. Number three is making your management training theoretical. Now, theory has a purpose. The purpose of theory is to prove that whatever it is that you're teaching has some sort of scholastic or academic proof somewhere up the line. This is really important if you are a lecturer at college, but where it is not important is when you're trying to do skills transfer to overworked and overwhelmed managers. They could care less about theory. What they need is solutions in the moment. So the reason theory finds its way into corporate training is that a lot of corporate trainers have a background in academia. In academia, you have to keep a class engaged for three hours at a time. When you start giving out solid meat, like you would in a corporate training event, you'll be done in 30 minutes. So how do you keep people around for the full three? You give them a bunch of theory. Theory has its place, but to be honest, Maslow, Hertzberg, all these characters that are dead and gone have no relevance to a manager who is struggling in the moment. So if you want to screw up your training effort, make it theoretical. Nobody cares about theory when they're drowning in problems. That's mistake number three. Number two, and I gotta be careful here because I am at Boss Builders, our company is an outside training vendor. But the key here is the word blindly, blindly outsourcing your management development to an outside training vendor. For a period of time, I worked as a contract trainer for a large training vendor. And I learned from being on the inside looking out that a lot of times organizations ended up buying stuff they didn't need because of an overzealous salesperson. So these are some of the things to watch out for. You go to an outside training vendor and you say, hey, my boss told me we need to have training on change management. Instead of asking, well, tell me a little bit about the change, they'll say, oh, we have a great program. It's a two-day program on change management. And for an extra fee, we'll customize it for you. And then you say, well, that sounds good. How much will that cost? And then they'll say, well, what is your training budget? See, this is what happens when you go to the car dealership. It should not happen with management training. So here's my advice. If you're going to use an outside training vendor, which that's fine to do, make sure you know clearly what is the identified need and that for a fact training will fix it and be very specific using only vendors that provide something that you cannot already do internally. But if you just simply open up your wallet and say, help us out, then my big question is, if you're doing that, what good are you? And that's your job security and your credibility. So the operative word here is blindly. Don't do it blindly, do it with eyes wide open. Use somebody that's trustworthy and reputable. That's number two. Which brings us to number one. Number one is so big that I'm gonna give you a quiz to see if you can figure it out. So here we go. I don't have a book to give you, but see if you can figure it out. The biggest mistake ever made is, and here you go. Hmm, some of these are awfully tempting, aren't they? Hmm, yeah, 
Yeah, I know. You probably have the right answer in your head. And here's the truth. If you look at this slide and you see the right answer on this slide, you have failed because the right answer is not on this slide. In fact, what I'll tell you is every one of these answers, I just pulled these out of thin air. I just made this up and I did it very specifically. You see, I think what happens is people think that management development is this complicated thing. And to be perfectly honest, developing managers isn't all that complicated if you know exactly what the right thing is to do. And so, and it's amazing how many people fall for number two. I completely just pulled that one out of my rear end. So yeah, the reason I wanted you to do this is don't be fooled by things that seem complicated. It's very simple. So the number one biggest mistake is this one right here. It's assuming that everybody in a position of authority needs to be a leader. And right now you're thinking, okay, I'm going to stop the video because this is all a bunch of baloney. Mac is telling us that leaders are not good. No, that's not what Mac is telling you. What Mac is telling you is that don't make the assumption everybody has to be a leader. And the reason I do that takes us right back to this graphic right here. Now it's interesting because you look at the parallel. The boss drives employees and the leader coaches them. The boss inspires fear. The leader generates enthusiasm. The boss, God forbid, takes credit, but the leader gives credit. If you compare these two, what you're really doing is comparing the difference between an apple and a bowling ball. They're both round, but they're so different. So what really kind of fools people is they assume the boss is bad and evil. And sometimes they mismatch boss with manager. So going back to Captain Davies from the story I started the, the uh, video with, one day he told me, he said, Pit out to Monroe, you know, I'm not a leader. And I'm thinking, yeah, no kidding. He says, I'm not a leader, I'm a manager. And I thought that was good. I thought that made sense until years later when I realized that he just insulted managers too. He was neither a leader or a manager. What Captain Davies was, to be perfectly honest, was a bad boss. And if you look at the list of boss behaviors there, please don't assume all of these are bad because is it important that a boss every now and then has to drive employees? Absolutely. Or depend on authority? Yeah, absolutely. Or place blame for the breakdown? Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. And then this one here, this is tricky, right? Is it okay that the boss takes credit? Yeah. How about if the boss makes a poor decision and everything is screwed up? Wouldn't it be great if the boss said, you know what, that's on me. That was my decision. I screwed up. So why not, instead of comparing boss to leader, why don't we just assume that everything in the list there is traits of a bad boss. The opposite of a bad boss then would be a good boss. So that's what we're going to solve. How do we build good bosses? And that's what we're going to get into. Let's begin, and this is in your handout too, by starting with expectations. So if we're going to build better bosses, we've got to figure out what exactly we're expecting of them. And so we start with this model here. Now this is one, to be honest, I learned this in the Navy. What separates the Navy from other military services is how we handle fighting fires. So for example, if you're in the Air Force and there's a fire, well you'd run to the fire alarm and pull it and then you'd stand by the flagpole and take roll. But in the Navy, if you're aboard a ship and there's a fire, everybody becomes a firefighter. So very early in basic training, we learned how to fight fires, and we were shown this exact model. Our instructors told us that three elements make a fire burn, and those are heat, fuel, and oxygen. And so they wrote them on this model. And what they told us then is, if those three elements have to be together to burn, then to put a fire out, simply remove one of those elements. And I thought that makes total sense. So the question is, what does that have to do with us? Well, nothing, but let's build a new fire. Let's build the fire of the great boss. And we find there's three areas that are expectations of a great boss. We'll start at the bottom with the basic, and that is they have to have the ability to fix systems and processes. Now, keep in mind that in most cases, people are promoted to the role of supervisor because they're really good technical experts. And that's important because if you've ever had a dumb boss, you know what a painful experience that is. And so we got to make sure that anybody that gets promoted to be the boss, they know what they're doing. They become the answer people when there's a problem. So that's an expectation that I think we need to start with. But you know, there's a second expectation that we need to build, and that is they have the responsibility of protecting the house. The boss is typically the first line of defense against any threats to the organization. 
And the threats, we find that there's three of them. The first is, is maybe safety, OSHA type things. So they have to protect their workforce from safety problems. A second might be HR issues, you know, compliance things, uh, EEO, sexual harassment. And, and this is a good way to sell your compliance training, that really boring training nobody wants to go to, or they watch it on their computer and simply click through the slides and then guess at the quiz. Let your managers know that by signing on that roster, they have signed away their right to tell a judge, hey, I didn't know. Because the judge will look at that roster and say, listen, now you either knew or you should have known. So you're still on the hook for this. So you can scare them into paying attention to boring compliance training. Third threat is an organization's reputation, customer service. So if they're on the front line, they need to be really aware of anything that could pose a PR nightmare. That's three areas to protect the house. Most of you probably figure it's an HR responsibility for all three, and, and to be honest, aside from compliance, it's not. It comes down to the boss. So set the expectation. That's the second. The third is developing people. Now, this is one where a lot of bosses say, well, I don't have the time. What they're really telling you is they don't have the skills or the confidence. So they're thinking of other things that are in the way where they don't have time to sit down and have these really important performance conversations. Since this one is so common, we're going to focus a lot of what we do in this, this seminar on how do we instill better abilities for people to develop people. And at the end, I'll give you the option of watching a second video, one that I think you should send to your workforce on how to be a great boss, and it goes into great detail on how to develop people. But like the fire triangle, all three of these have got to be in place or this fire is going to go out. So step one is to find expectations. Now, step two then is to define success. To do that, we use a model that we call the three-legged stool of great performance. And at Boss Builders, we use this for every workshop and every keynote that we give. We do because it's a useful model. In fact, if you take nothing else out from this video, please take this with you. In fact, if you're thinking about getting a tattoo, may I recommend this, probably right here on your forearm so you could look at it all the time because this one's gonna be really useful. Now, in a three-legged stool model where all three legs are evenly balanced, the question is what happens when a leg breaks? Well, the answer is, of course, all of it falls down. So for a boss to have great performance, there's three legs that have to be in place. The first leg is what we call the leg of skill. And so this is how it would play out. You get a manager in your office and the manager has screwed something up royally. So the first question you might wanna ask is, do you even know what you're doing? And if they say, no, I had no idea. We know it's a skill problem and it's very important to note that skill is only fixed by training. Training is the only solution for skill. It does not solve any other problem. And so be very careful, and I'll get to this when we get to the focus leg in a moment, that you don't prescribe training for every little problem. It, it only solves one problem, and that is a problem of somebody who does not know what to do in a particular situation or how to do a particular skill. That's the first. Now the second we're gonna look at is the leg of focus. The leg of focus becomes an issue when somebody is highly skilled, but somehow still not successful. And there's two, way that, two ways that we measure focus issues. And the first is, is that boss's performance aligned with corporate values? And so if you at your organization have corporate values, it's very important that you coach the managers up on how to do their job according to those values. So for example, example at Boss Builders, um, we have corporate values and one of ours is friendly. And so what we're saying here is that when you deal with us at Boss Builders, you should expect that we will treat you in a friendly manner. And so that being the case, all of our associates and our sales team knows that that friendly is number one. And then we have integrity, and then we have generosity, and we have speed and simplicity. Everything we do aligns with those values. And if somebody can't do their job for us at Boss Builders aligned with those values, they're gone. And we don't tolerate it. I don't care how skilled they are. We have a reputation. And so as a manager, it's very important that you are aligning your behaviors with your corporate values and enforcing those in others. There's a second way that you can measure focus. And by the way, if you're wondering how do you fix a focus problem, you don't do it through training. It's done through coaching, feedback, and mentoring. And we're going to cover coaching and mentoring a little bit later in this video. So stay tuned for that. But here's a second way that you can look at focus problems. 
and is using a tool that we have at Boss Builders. And what this suggests then is that every position in every organization has different focus factors. And what the focus factors do is they give you an idea of what is expected of a person in the job and how are they going to do their skills. And so we have communication, self-structure, perspective, relationship, work style, and mindset. And very briefly, I'm gonna walk you through these. And remember, the way that we make adjustments here is through coaching, feedback, and mentoring, not training. So for example, let's look at our first focus factor of communication. There is an extreme up. Now remember, we're looking at a position, not a human. We wanna look at the position and see if the human in the position actually aligns. So uh, the, the communication focus factor, as the other ones do have two extremes. The extreme up for communication is high assertive, which means you're very comfortable telling people what you want. The other extreme down is more reflective. You're more comfortable asking for what you want. For someone to be in the position of the boss, you have to determine what are you looking for. And my suggestion would be they should be somebody who is a little more on the assertive side. They have to step up and step out. That's focus factor number one. The second one is self-structure. Some jobs require you to multitask, to do many things well. Others, single task, do one task start to finish. As the boss, and probably too as HR, you're expected to do many things well. And the danger here is that you could take somebody who is an individual contributor and they're used to doing one task start to finish. Then you promote them to supervisor. Now they got to take care of a lot of things. Some people don't survive this. So you may have to coach them up on how to do many things well. And again, this could depend on your organization. There isn't a set formula for everybody in the role of the boss. This could be different depending on your organization, but it's up to you, the HR professional, to determine what is the correct pattern and how does the person in the role align with the correct pattern. The third is perspective. The extreme up is high visionary, big picture thinking. The other is realistic, down in the details. Now let's say, for example, that you have a staff accountant. My guess is that you would want them to be more realistic in the details. But what if they got promoted then to director of finance or even CFO? See, now they're going to have to be more visionary. Because I'm telling you, if you had a CFO who was in the details, that would be the kind of person that would get after you for buying toilet paper is they'd be too much into the details. You don't need that, you need somebody big picture. This is a transitional piece, very difficult. Fourth focus factor is relationship. This is how you make decisions. Now for, for some people, it, it, you're gonna want them to be on the emotional side. The other is rational. My suggestion for the boss is you have to be kind of in the middle. There's gonna come a time you're gonna have to consider the feelings of a person, but other times you're gonna have to use data. The fifth focus factor is the work style. Now, this one's a tricky one too. As an individual contributor, most of the time you are working on a team. But when you get promoted to be the supervisor, you're suddenly going to have to be an individual. And the challenge here is that you take someone who was an individual contributor, you move them to the role of the boss. Now they don't have anybody that they can talk to anymore. They can't go back and vent to their former peers. You need to connect them with another group. And later when we talk about roundtables, this is so important because they need the support. The role of the boss is highly individual. And so they need to have some sort of team that they can rely on. The final focus factor is the mindset. And this one's kind of tricky. The extreme up is optimism. or hoping for the best outcome. The extreme down is pessimism, which doesn't mean negativity. It means that we trust but verify. My recommendation is that whoever is in the role of the boss, they have to trust but verify. Because again, any mistakes they make reflect on you, the HR professional. So make sure they trust but verify. So the way we would use this, and you're welcome to do this, is to just take a look at each role in your organization and ask yourself what's the right focus pattern for someone as the supervisor in that department. And then find the person in the role and see if they align. If they misalign, those gaps would be fixed through coaching, feedback, and mentoring, okay? Well, that brings us really to the third leg of the three-legged stool. And the way we talk about that is, that's the leg of will, by the way. It's, are they motivated to do the job? And so that's why we have to take a look at what is the motive? Why does a person actually wanna be the boss? And that's what we find here on page seven, step three. We gotta make sure we're recruiting the right people. And so what we found is that there are different reasons why people want to be the boss. And I've presented here, I think, seven of the most common ones. 
you know, only two of these are probably good signs. And so we start with legacy. I want to be the boss because I want to leave a legacy. Well, that one sounds good, but you got to make sure that the legacy they leave is an intentionally developed positive legacy. Captain Davies, he left a legacy too. It's a legacy of horror. In fact, when we wind this presentation up, I'm going to tell you one more Captain Davies story and you'll see what legacy looks like. If it's going to be legacy, make sure it's a good legacy. The second driver is ego. I want to be the boss because I just think that I deserve it. Now, this is bad news right here. If it's an ego thing and you get a little power with that ego, it's not going to be a good thing. So be very careful. And again, I would recommend you question somebody who comes in and says, I'd like to be a supervisor. And your question might be, tell me what's important to you about being the boss and see if you can find it here. Third one is money. Now, it's possible that you will make more money if you move into the role of the supervisor. But, you know, and you know this as an HR professional, the job you do is so difficult that no matter how much money you make, you're still not compensated adequately, are you? Same rule applies to the boss. It is a tough job. So money is good, but I promise you will work way harder than the amount of money you're going to get. So just double check this one. Fourth one is respect. I want to be the boss because I want people to take me seriously. Well, I'll tell you what, if they don't exhibit the right behaviors, they'll never get respect. A person could respect the title or like we did in the military. I respect the rank, but not you. And, and you got to be able to respect the whole person. So if you think this is going to be it, you better be respect worthy. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Another driver is personal vision. And this might be OK, too. You know, ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to be the boss. OK, if that's a natural career progression and you're doing the right things, that's fine, too. For some, it's power. I want to be the boss because I want to be in charge. And with power, of course, you know, comes great responsibility. So make sure that they're after the right kind of power. The last one, the last driver is a sense of duty. I think that I owe it to the organization to up my game so I could be a good boss. I think you could work with that. So really sense of duty, personal vision, those are good reasons. Any of the other ones, you might have to really double check. If you start with the right raw materials, you're probably going to have much more success. So you as the HR professional, you need to weigh in on this one. That's step number three. Well, step number four then is we got to get busy building. And so there's a lot of meat in this model, and we're going to look at different parts of it together, and we'll explode the drawing out for you, and then we'll get into strategy, and then we'll be done. But the way I want you to look at this model is by looking first on the y-axis at the organizational value of somebody in the role of the boss. And then we're going to take a look across the bottom then of these stages of development. Now keep in mind, depending on the stage of development, the value is going to either increase or decrease. And, and so at the end, we'll look at this again. But we're going to focus now on the stages of development. So let's start with a typical pattern of management experience. And it starts at the very beginning with stage one. Stage one is when a person gets the call and is told, hey, starting Monday, you're going to be the supervisor of your department. And they probably say, man, that's great. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get going. It looks like they're three-legged stools in good shape, doesn't it? But to be honest, that's just a facade. That's overconfidence. Notice in red underneath each of these little models of this three-legged stool, there is a a style of coaching and guiding that is for you to do. And the first one there is to orient them. And so a good response could be, wow, I see you're really excited, but let me tell you what this role looks like and let them know, let them know that, boy, this is, it's going to be hard, long hours. You're going to have all kinds of issues to deal with. That theoretically should put them right into stage two. Stage two, notice the skill leg and the focus leg are gone, but the will leg is there. And that's good because they're motivated and they are teachable. And if you're looking for the right time to give management training, it's when a person is in stage two. Newly promoted to supervisor, they don't know what they don't know, but they're willing to learn. That is a great place to be. And in our experience at Boss Builders, when we do an on-site workshop and we have people like that, it is just a phenomenal experience because we don't have to tell them, hey, we got four hours of material and they roll their eyes. They're like, God, I wish we had eight hours of material. So you as the HR professional, I know you would love to have managers have a great training experience. The way to do that is number one, get good trainers and good material, but better yet, make sure it's the right audience. Stage two, they're teachable. 
Let them know in stage two that stage three is right around the corner, typically six to eight weeks in, and that is where the legs all break. And notice there, the style is micromanage. Now we get a lot of pushback at boss builders for two reasons. Number one, people criticize us for using boss. Now you already know bosses aren't evil, right? But the other one we get criticized for is because we say micromanagement's important. And nobody I know likes micromanagement. But trust me on this one, if you need it, it's the best solution you could possibly have. Now, think about this. You are at the beach in the summertime and you're a pretty good swimmer. So you swim out a little bit too far and get stuck in a riptide. Now, a riptide is a scary thing because it drags you out to sea. And the harder you swim in, the further out you get dragged. So in a moment of desperation, what you do is you, you yell for the lifeguard. Lifeguard comes out, goes to the edge of the water, brings up the bullhorn and says, okay, you got this now. Just be positive. Think happy thoughts. All of us on the beach are cheering for you. You can do it. And you're thinking, you're crazy. Come out and get me. I'm drowning. See, that's what micromanagement is. And that's the perfect use of it, right? When somebody's drowning. The reason why people tend to hate it is because they experience it like this. You're a decent swimmer swimming laps at the YMCA. You've got your little goggles on. Ladies probably have a nice swim cap. The men are wearing a Speedo, right? So you're going back and forth swimming laps with your perfect flip turns. And then you stop in the lane because you get water in your goggle. So you're emptying out the water and the lifeguard blows the whistle and dives in and grabs you by the neck. And you're thinking, what are you doing? He says, you're drowning. And you, and you say, no, I'm not drowning. I'm a good swimmer. Well, obviously you don't know how to swim. So you know what? Get to the side of the pool and I'm going to give you swimming lessons. And you're thinking, you're crazy. See, that's how most of us have experienced micromanagement. And it's not healthy when someone doesn't need it. But I'm telling you, somebody in stage three, they need to be rescued. Let them know ahead of time that that day will come. And then when it comes, tell them, come see me. Tell me, hey, I'm in stage three and I will get you out of the mud. That's stage three. The more time you spend with a person in stage two, the shorter the stay in three will be. Now, when they start to get confidence back, that's typically where we see stage four. Notice the legs are there, but they're kind of cracked. And so the key here is learning how to coach. When you coach, what you're doing is you're helping co-create solutions. What you don't want to do is feed them the answer because then they'll never leave you. They're going to come to your office for every little stupid problem. Get them to start handling it on their own as their confidence builds. Coaching is very different from micromanaging. Coaching, you don't tell them what to do. Coaching, they come up with a solution. You just simply let them bounce ideas off of you. The goal is to get them to stage five. Notice in stage five that skill, will, and focus are all high, and that's a great place to be. Your job then is simply support them. Imagine what life would be like for you if every manager in your organization was in stage five. I bet you would have a lot less stress. And so let me tell you, that is completely doable, and you can do it by following the steps we're going to give you when we get to the next section. All right? Beware of stage six. This is what happens when somebody has a lot of potential they outgrow the role. And you're going to know that because their motivation is going to go down and their focus will be up and down, but their skill is high. It's important that you engage them in a conversation and, and bring it to their attention that you've noticed. They don't seem like they're as motivated. What they may tell you is, I feel like I'm outgrowing this role. And so let's say you promote them to the next level of management. They're going to go back to stage one and that cycle continues. Now, it's really important to note, and we'll go back to this. Look at the graph. Anybody who's in stages one to three are a liability to your organization. And they are because there's risk factors there, right? Their skills are low. So that means get them out of three as quickly as possible. Only in stage four are they going to be at break-even level. But if you're a for-profit business, break-even is not good. You need to be able to have invaluable, indispensable managers. And that's what happens when you get to stage five. Notice in stage six, the value diminishes. Well, I hope I have your attention because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how to do it. All right. So let's go to the slide. Next slide, page nine in your handout. This is a very busy Venn diagram. And so what it shows, if you look at it first, is that right in the middle is the separating line. Everything on top is done through training. Everything on the bottom is done through development. And in each of these, you're going to see three areas. There's teaching, application and guiding. And each of these have recommended tools I'm going to share with you that will really help you out. So I'm going to break this up for you so it's easier to see. We're going to start with T. 
teaching, which is in the hemisphere of training, and these are the recommendations that we give you. First of all, if you're going to do training, short, sweet, and to the point. A few years ago, my son came home from college on spring break. He didn't have any money, so he asked if he could come home and bring his roommate, and I said, absolutely. And then he asked me if they could go shooting. We live on a lot of property here in Tennessee, and, and I says, yeah, you guys can go shooting, but you got to buy your own ammo and you got to clean my guns. Well, it was really interesting because I was watching them as they were cleaning my guns. They just got a YouTube video, and we're watching step by step how to field strip and clean these weapons. And I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, you know, the way most people do corporate training is they say, oh, you need to know how to clean a weapon? Well, good news. Two months from now, we're going to have a one-day class on theory of firearms, and I think they cover field stripping. Well, the problem with that is multiple, right? Number one, I can't wait two months. Number two, I don't want to sit through a whole day of theory to get to that one thing that I'm struggling with. And so like I do with home projects, and I'm sure many of you do, you go to YouTube and you pull a short video on how to. In fact, if you see a video that's 30 minutes and one that's seven minutes, I'll bet you look at the seven minute one because you don't have time for a lot of nonsense. Same rule applies to training. This is why we came up with our Boss Builder Academy. It has 45 short how-to videos that go from the basics of being the boss all the way to next step as the boss. Five to seven minutes, fill in the blanks, short, sweet, to the point. You can do that with your stand-up training. We have a program we call Driving Results. If you do that end-to-end, -end, it's four solid days of training. We never recommend somebody do it like that. Most of our customers do two-hour blocks, and that's about as long as I'd recommend. And we come back you know, every month for seven months or eight months. And that's the best way you can assimilate it. Make sure whatever you're teaching is a how-to. Remember, that's skill. Remember, skills are fixed through training. Skills, it means I know how to do a thing. And so the training topic should be how-to. Notice that the title of this webinar is How to Build a Better Boss. So you're hopefully learning skills to do that. The last piece there is keep it simple. Now, simple doesn't mean simplistic. And do not fall into the trap of assuming that somebody who is technically educated needs the same level of management training. So uh, a while back, I was doing some work with a company that has uh, PhD level people. Now these folks are high-end scientists, newly promoted to supervisor. And so right away, I get a request, we need some high level stuff. And I'm always a little wary because I'm thinking, okay, high level is fine if you're learning more technical. You're in something you know nothing about. That's no different than if I have like my two and a half year old granddaughter who just learns how to go pee pee on the potty. The next step is not teaching her how to run my chainsaw, right? We gotta go with something that is commensurate with their level of development. I don't care if you have a PhD. If you are brand new to supervisor, you need supervisor 101. So in this case, this group uses our Boss Builder Academy. Nobody has ever said this material is too basic. Contrast that with another customer of ours it is a retailer for teenage fashions. The supervisors there are 17, 18, 19. They use the exact same program and none of them have ever said this stuff's over my head. There is a sweet spot and the sweet spot happens in that area where somebody doesn't know the basics of being a great boss. So if you're gonna do training, short, sweet, to the point, how to, simple topics. No need for three day blowouts, zero need for theory, so those five mistakes we talked about, you can see where they crash and burn right here. All right, now, second stage of our diagram then is the application. So once we've learned the skills, the application is key. Several years ago, I had a customer and I had done a lot of management training for this group. And at the end of a training year, I had a last course, there was 12 people in the class and I asked them, how many of you have had me for a class? There's about 100 plus managers at this company. Well. 10 of the 12 hands went up and I said, oh good, what class was it? Well, only two could remember the class. And then I asked those two, what's one thing you remember from the class they could remember nothing? And it was then that I realized that you could overtrain a person and there has to be a way for that information, that knowledge, those skills to be able to come out and be really, really, I guess, built upon. I suggested to the training manager that in the coming year we experiment with something. I just kind of pulled the name out of thin air I called it a round table. What that meant is that managers would meet for an hour in smaller groups. They would bring all of their course materials and yet they would bring their challenges. We weren't going to be standing up doing training. We were going to let them do a lot of talking. 
What we did is we facilitated the round table and people began to get solutions for their problems using the tools we had taught previously. The training manager, of course, wanted to keep numbers, which is important, and so he made it mandatory they go to at least two round tables a year. Well, we started to find that every month we saw the same people coming back, and I asked them, I said, hey, didn't you get your numbers? And they said, yeah, but this is the only thing that's ever really benefited me. We recommend, and we recommend this with every program we do at Boss Builders, that you facilitate a round table. We've even got a really nice 24 session guide, how to videos and templates. So you could run this because if you don't run a round table, all of that training is going to go right in one ear, not the other. This is where the application happens and that's huge. Well, the third area of that Venn diagram then is the guiding piece. All right. So now we have transferred the skills. We have improved the ability to do the skills. The last piece then is to get a person to be even more effective. And we do that through coaching and mentoring. So a couple of things with coaching. First of all, coaching is done with a coaching approach. A coaching approach means that we are going to help a person co-create solutions. Our strategic partner, Wisdom Tree Coaching, has a really, really good half-day workshop called Coaching as a Discipline for Managers. I strongly recommend every manager you have go through this program. You can get more information at wisdomtreecoaching.com. Coaching can also be done by a certified coach, but we recommend that for leadership development, which we're going to touch on in just a moment. But realize that coaching is not telling a person what to do. It's coming alongside them and co-creating solutions. Managers need to do this with other managers. You probably will have to do it too as an HR professional. The second area that you can use is mentoring. Now, what mentoring is, is that you find somebody that has skills and abilities in a persona that you admire and you simply follow them and you learn to grow similar to them. Now, first of all, it should be organic, which means it should flow naturally. So people ask me all the time, Mac, who would you want to be your mentor? And they probably think it's like Ken Blanchard or, you know, one of these management gurus. And, and I always surprise them because I say, I would love to have Gene Simmons as my mentor. And they're like the kiss guy with the big tongue. And I'll say, yeah. And they say, why? He's a musician. I said, yeah, he's a musician, but he's also a branding and licensing expert. Those are areas that I would love to know more about to make my business more effective. Gene Simmons knows how to do it. If I could plant myself next to him for a few days, I would grow exponentially. I want him to be my mentor. Now, this is where it crashes and burns, because if we were in a corporation, you would say, well, Mac, you want branding experience and marketing. Why don't you mentor under Jim, our director of marketing? And I would say, okay, yeah, when was the last time Jim learned something new about marketing? He sits in front of a computer all day. So this is what happens when you make mentoring a program and you start forcing relationships. That's why I say organic is so important. Self-driven means that it's driven by the mentee. And even though some of your senior folks would say, I have no time to mentor somebody, I'm willing to bet if somebody said, well, I really admire you, I'd love for you to mentor me, I bet they'd carve out some time for that. The Middle Tennessee SHRM that I belong to has a mentoring program every year and I always participate as a mentor and I'll be honest, I learn more from those mentees and I'm sure they learn from me. So it's a growth opportunity for both. But don't curse it by calling it a mentoring program. It's going to cause it to die a, a really agonizing slow death. You definitely don't need that. Put those three together and if you do that, there's a very good chance you're going to get a great boss. Well, that leads us then to the last piece, and that is some parts for you to remember. All right, so these are some things I'd recommend now, and then we'll talk a bit about leadership and we'll be done. First of all, identify your bench right now. We want to start with really good raw materials, and so you could go back to the slide on the motives for the boss and find the right people. And if you're going to grow them, get the new successful boss involved in that. Somebody who's come through your program, who now has skills and abilities, they are the best person to help a person grow. Guide your high potentials now as they prepare to move up. And this means calling out poor performance and bad behavior now before they get the call. Somebody who you think is high potential, they might be doing things right now that they will regret when they become the boss. Maybe they come in late from breaks. They take too many cigarette breaks. And what's it going to look like when they have to call out their own team? Their team is going to say, ah, well, I see how it is now. Keep your bad bosses on a short leash and don't hesitate to dump them if they show no interest in improving. A bad boss can cost your organization 
dollars morale. Don't do it. If they show no interest in improving, don't send them to more training. Get rid of them. Which brings us to leadership, okay? Everybody criticizes us and says, you just believe in bosses, not leaders. We believe in leadership development. We just don't do it. So I'm going to tell you, if you have really good bosses and you want to develop them, here's some suggestions. First of all, make sure the workforce is fit to be led. Now, that's a tricky one. In a lot of our experiences, we go to broken organizations. There is uh, conflict, backstabbing, rampant negative organizational politics, apathy. Some of these organizations, I'm surprised, are still in business. If that is what the organization looks like, they do not need leaders. They need good bosses to clamp down on the poor performance. If your workforce is not fit to be led, as a leader, you're going to struggle. So let's have a look at some of these diagrams, right? Remember these? I just cut out the leader piece. So let's say that you are trying to lead an organization that's dysfunctional. Coaching, goodwill, we, let's go. That will not work. You're going to get laughed at. Take a look at the second one here. Here's the leader in the dysfunctional organization. These people, these three characters behind them, they're not doing anything. One of them's stabbing them in the back. One's trying to kick them in the ass. And the other one's just laughing. The leader here is being made fun of. This last one here, uh, the leader is not the person here. The leader is actually right down here. And trust me, this is not water raining down on your head. So do not try leadership development if your organization is chaotic. That's rule number one. Number two, make sure whoever goes through leadership development is fully competent. They have gone through your basic boss training. They have shown the ability to fix systems and processes, protect the house, and develop others. And if that is true, then start development. We always recommend a 360 survey. 360 surveys take a great deal of courage because you may find out you're not as awesome as you thought you were. And so if you're going to do it, you got to make sure a person is willing and you use a qualified vendor to do that. If indeed you are needing this, let us know. We will refer our strategic coaching partner to you who has a very good 360 and can work people through this. That said, too, if you're going to use a leadership coach, make sure they are ICF certified. That certification means that they have actually passed a body of knowledge and a code of ethics that they will operate. Everybody can call himself a coach, but a certified coach has got some real credibility. Again, if you're looking for this, let me know. We have a strategic partner, Wisdom Tree Coaching. We highly recommend using them. Make sure there's goals with plans, focused reading and discussion, and continued mentorship. The leader develops differently. In, in our experience, the best way to do it is not a bunch of classroom training. It's one-on-one -on -one effort. If you want to develop those skills, a lot of it is learning how to maximize what's already in here. Training in a workshop is not going to do that. So with that, let's end with this. Um, April of 2018, I was giving this very talk at the Washington State SHRM Conference in Seattle. And when I was done, I walked out and this brunette woman came up and she said, hey, Mac, do you remember me? And I thought, oh, my God, it's Rhonda. How are you? So here's the irony of all this. Rhonda is now the vice president of human resources for a credit union in Washington state. But back in 1995 through 97, she worked for me at the Naval Dental Clinic on Silverdale Subbase in Washington state where I was working with the evil Captain Davies. She was one of my technicians. And so I was shocked. And we sat up for an hour and we talked and I had to take the selfie, of course. And it was interesting because I posted it up on my Facebook because I have a lot of shipmates that I serve with who are on my Facebook. And I talked about how proud I was of Rhonda. And it was interesting because even though some people said good job, most of them said, you know what, that just brings back the worst memories of Captain Davies. It's like you just picked a scab. Mind you, this is over 20 years ago and people are reacting as if it happened just yesterday. One of the female dental officers told me, she says, I don't know if you knew this, but I requested from Captain Davies the command send me TAD for my continuing education dental program, which I need to keep my license. All I asked for was tickets for the ferry, $10. Captain Davies said, I'm not going to do that because the Navy just paid for you to have a baby. They should not have to pay for your ferry tickets. Earlier I said, you'll always remember the best boss you ever had. You'll always remember the worst boss you ever had. Everybody else in between is just a blur. I think it's safe to say that Captain Davies has left a legacy. And, and I'm letting you know that not to blast him, 
It's just so you can help bosses at your organization do better when it comes down to being a better boss. So with that, this is done. And, and what I'll tell you is that if you found this talk interesting, what we will do at Boss Builders is do a free one hour lunch and learn for your managers. If it's possible, we could do this in person. We'll also do a webinar live if you want. And we do this because it's important for you to get a kickoff, to be able to do your program. And the beauty is typically an outsider like one of us tends to have more respect and credibility. I hate to say that, but then you'll hear this, you know, why didn't you tell us to do that? And you'll say, I did, but they believe the outsider. Let us help you. No cost, no obligation. If you're interested, you can email us. You can email me directly, mac at thebossbuilders.com. You can check us out uh, online, thebossbuilders.com, and you can call us direct at 931-221-2988. We would love to partner with you, and we do believe we've got solutions at Boss Builders that'll be very useful for you. We have our Boss Builder Academy video series that we talked about earlier. We also do our four-day basic boot camp driving results program. And in your organization, if you already have a training team in place, we actually license our materials. And so all three of those are options we offer. All three would be great. Let us know if you have questions. We would love to partner with you. But more importantly, we just want to support you as you take on our mission of creating the next great generation of awesome bosses. Thank you so much.